Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Daniel Farkas is co-founder and CEO of Drops, where he helps people all around the world learn languages in a new and enjoyable way. Following an epiphany that most of us are never actually taught how to learn, Daniel spent over a decade researching how to do it right. In 2015, Daniel and his co-founder, Mark, created a language game unlike anything you've ever tried. Drops is available on Apple and Android devices and has become the fastest growing language learning app in the world. On this episode, Daniel dives deep on meta earning, how Drops hires and develops their remote workers, and how you can develop your ability to learn. Each week, so many amazing podcasts come out. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to listen to them all. That's why I love Podcast Notes. What Podcast Notes does is they write up some of the top podcasts and top episodes with their tips, takeaways, and quotes so you get everything you need out of that episode without having to spend all that time listening. They also have an unbelievable weekly newsletter. And this weekly newsletter has the takeaways from the top business, health, and lifestyle podcasts. It's one of the few newsletters I subscribe to and certainly think you guys would love checking it out. So remember, it's podcastnotes.org and also subscribe to that weekly newsletter they're putting out. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand They're MCT Co., and they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high-quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. Do you guys miss your favorite childhood cereals but had to give them up because of all the sugar? Meet Catalina Crunch, the world's first keto-friendly, zero-sugar cereal in delicious dark chocolate, cinnamon toast, maple waffle, and honey graham. When the founder of Catalina Crunch was diagnosed at age 17 with type 1 diabetes, he set out to satisfy his chocolate craving and create his own. This low-carb, zero-sugar cereal will power you through the day with 10 grams of plant-based protein, 6 grams grams of fiber to fill you up and is also gluten-free, grain-free, dairy-free, and 100% plant-based. Don't forget about that turmeric as well to help fight inflammation and boost immunity. If you want to enjoy and receive 10% off your entire order, head to CatalinaCrunch.com. That's Catalina, C-A-T-A-L-I-N-A, Crunch.com, and use code WGYT10 for 10% off. I just finished snacking on some of the dark chocolate, and it was delicious. You guys need to head out and pick some up today. Daniel, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you so much. How are you? I am doing very well. I'm excited to learn more about you, more about Drops, but let's get this conversation started with how you start your day. Is there any routines or or things you've implemented that you like to begin your day with? Well, uh, so my day started by my three-year-old son. So he wakes me up (laughs) and and my, my girlfriend. So Basically, he's our uh, bio uh, alarm clock. Um, so a little bit of play with him. Uh, this is the day starter, better than coffee. Uh, so I actually just kicked uh, the coffee habit for, for morning. It's uh, I think it's a life changer, not being uh, dependent on coffee to, to, to wake up. Uh, I, I still do, do drink some coffee, 10 a.m. ish. So um, yeah, uh, play with my, my little uh, kiddo and um, have some light breakfast, avocado, eggs, uh, things like this. And then, um, yeah. Uh, we have a stand up at 10 a.m., so that's when the the work starts. So yeah, not, nothing special. I try to cram uh, some cardio in the morning to get the the blood flowing. Um, but yeah, it's it's not not always uh, feasible <laughs> with a kid at a startup. Yep, I know how that is. So you mentioned the, the 10 a.m. meeting. 
what is important prior to that meeting? Is there anything that you do personally to get yourself ready other than the cardio and the breakfast? Is there any work-related things you do? Um, not really work-related. Uh, I try to do uh, uh, at least a 10-minute meditation to clear my head. So I, I think it's essential to start the day with a clear head and uh, being as light uh, as possible before, before the madness starts at, at 10 a.m., um, so, uh, I, I try to really empty my, my mind and, and really prepare for that, uh, that work day because those, those tends to be quite intense these days. What does your meditation practice look like? Oh, so it's, um, it's basically a super simple concentrating on, on my breath, uh, and that's it. So, um, I guess the purest form, uh, quite simple, quite basic. Um, I used to do guided meditation. But um, yeah, these days I'm just sitting in silence and, and enjoy that 10 minute of thinking about nothing. So I'm, I'm always asking the question about what are you doing currently, things like that. You've already mentioned two things that you've eliminated, coffee in the morning and then also the guided meditation. Is there anything else mm -hmm. you've eliminated that you just thought didn't work too well for you? Wow, that's a great question. Yeah, I think... Uh, it, it sounds crazy, but I think uh, the curse of our current generation is that we have too many choices, too many good choices. So, and you can't do anything at, at once. So, uh, the ability to to really focus on the essentials and and simplify things, I think that's a that's a life changing concept. And, and I try to really uh, reflect on my life uh, from time to time and and uh, ask the question: Is is it really needed in my life? Uh, because because there are, just, there are just so many things that try to uh, get into your life, uh, new opportunities, uh, new stuff um, to buy, new stuff. And, and those stuffs are basically starts to control you. Like every single obsession uh, wants, uh, wants a piece of your life, piece of your time, and then uh, you realize that you, you, you won't have time for yourself. So yeah, um, decluttering is, is a big thing for me. Uh, in terms of my life and, and also in terms of, of, of the product that we are building. Danny, you've got to help me out here. I have to be honest. The, the first two hours uh, in my morning, I was doing too many of these things. There were too many choices, too many articles I wanted to read, too many books I wanted to buy. Are there any things that you've been able to incorporate that help you eliminate some of this clutter? Mm, I think... You should have an inbox. I'm not sure if you are familiar with the GTD concept of inbox. So inbox is everything uh, that uh, that you can throw things into. It can be a physical container. It can be a software. So yeah. So I'm I'm a super curious guy. I love reading, and I have like a, a more like I don't know ten lifetimes of book uh, queued in my uh, in my um, uh, directory. But I, I simply don't have the time. So. I have a trusted place where I can just put all this stuff that I want to do uh, someday, and and I know. So my mind is uh, my mind is happy that those stuffs are are somewhere stored, but it's not cluttering in my life. So they they are, uh, for example, stuffs are not. Uh, I, I, for example, I started to declutter my physical books. So I have a handful of books, physical books, uh, on my on my bookshelf. But I'd rather uh, read ebooks because they don't take up uh, space. Uh, they don't take up mind space because, like, when you are when you're in a crowded room with a lot of books, uh, they crowd your your mind because you are looking at the the shelf and and things are getting into your mind. Like, okay, like all these books, all, all these memories are triggering some some memories, uh, like like old memories. And it's not a not a good way to 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 keep a, a sane mind. So so yeah, I, I I I try to go paperless as paperless as possible to own as uh, little as few things as possible. And uh, the books I have are more like reminders, uh, like books that were were life changing in my life. Uh, so I, I don't necessarily read them. But they are just good reminders. Uh, they remind me uh, for for certain uh, concepts and, and thoughts. I love that inbox concept. I've found it helpful for myself when certain ideas pop in my head. I'll write them down in the journal mm -hmm. just to eliminate that headspace that they clutter up there. I'm huge into reading, much like yourself. You mentioned there's a few books that will remain on your bookshelf. Any of those that you'd like to bring up? Oh, um, good question. So I'm obsessed with learning. 
So a couple of those books are connected to to the the meta layer of learning. For example, I love Art Art of Learning uh, from Josh Waiskin. Uh, that's a, that's a really good one. Um, yes, let me just fire up my my iBooks. Yeah, and I uh, check out. I, I reread Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin, uh a month or two ago. It was funny. I just mm -hmm. put that in my most recent newsletter just because the, uh, the amount I enjoy that book and, and much like yourself, I also am someone who's obsessed with learning and how to learn mm -hmm. better, more effectively, which is a large part why I was looking forward to this conversation. Cool. Um, so I think, yeah, I have, I have a, a book from Yvonne Chunar, the, the founder of, of Patagonia, Let My People Go Surfing. That's super inspiring in terms of uh, company building. Uh, like that, that guy uh, just didn't want to build a company uh, for the first place. Uh, it, it, just, it just happened for him. And uh, he just followed his, uh, his own path. So that's something that I'm, I'm truly inspired by. And um, yeah, that's one of the um, blueprints that I'm, uh, I'm using to build my own company. And there are... There is there's a four hour work week was a big one uh, back in the time. Um, so hacking uh, the life, uh, building the muse, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So that's definitely on, on my shelf. I really love uh, The Rise of Superman. I'm not sure if you've heard about that. It's basically flow hacking. Um, so flow is that uh, special magical state where Things are effortless uh, and yet super effective. Yeah, we had on uh, Stephen Kotler, who's the author of Rise of Superman. Oh, yeah. That, that was probably awesome. a, a hundred episodes ago, but I'm someone, I love that book. There's so many unbelievable research studies around mm -hmm. flow. So yeah, that's a great book. Yeah, I do have a yoga book uh, on my shelf. It's in Hungarian, so uh, I, I save you the... Uh, the name I actually don't know the name uh, by heart, but it it, uh, it definitely changed my my uh, my view on uh, spirituality and and how our body is connected to our mind. So these are a couple of, of uh, life changing ones. When you're reading these books, are you just reading them straight through? Do you take any notes? Is is there anything that you do a little differently? Yeah, I have a very rigorous uh, method of of uh, processing books. So first of all, I. I read them. Uh, I do a lot of highlighting and I do it all, a lot of noting. I love uh, the, the iBook app. I'm using that for, for highlighting and, and, and taking notes. So I'm, if, if the book is really, really good, I'm uh, reading it uh, from cover to cover. If it's not good, then I'm stopped right away. So I, I'm not getting into the Sankos fallacy. Uh, but if it's really good, I, I read it uh, all the way to the end and, and taking highlights and notes. So that's why I, um, I, I prefer ebooks because it makes um, note taking and highlighting so much more effective because the next step is exporting these highlights for me. And that's really hard to do with the physical books, even though you can do highlights, it's really, I mean, you, you basically you have to type in or use some uh, um, OCR application uh, to detect the text. But with, with iBooks, I can just uh, like literally two clicks, four clicks, uh, and I can export my my highlights and my notes. So that goes into Evernote. I'm going to have like a, like a summary of my notes. And uh, the next stage is basically I'm processing uh, these notes. And uh, I'm using a mind mapping software to, to see um, the like the big picture. And... Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm basically shaping these notes to my own taste, extracting uh, the most important, important uh, data points from from that. And at the end of the process, I'm I'm having like a like tailor made note for myself, uh, which is which contains the the sense of of the book, uh, at least for me, obviously. What's the mind mapping software you use? I'm using my note. I'm not sure if it's just for Mac or it's available for Windows as well. Uh, but I love the simplicity. So it's basically a perfect combination of uh, beautiful user interface and, uh, and it's quite powerful. So it, it contains exactly those uh, features that I know and it's beautiful. So, um, I mean, there are more powerful mind map software out there, but this is a, a golden middle. So my note. So you mentioned you basically at the end of this have your own tailor-made note. Is this something you go back to often or is it just the whole process of putting this together helps you store this information in your head? Yeah, I, I would say both. 
So I think every single step of this process uh, is really, really uh, valuable and, and powerful. Um, even even the one when you are processing these nodes. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm going from time to time. I'm going back to these uh, like the, the end result, um, the, the the finished product, and I also go back to the book itself and just uh, and just uh, skim through the the highlights in context. It's really important because you see uh, the, the context itself, um, and some. Sometimes I I read the whole chapter because I, I I want to get back to that that part and and dig a, a bit deep, deeper. You mentioned you're a big highlighter. What book do you think you've highlighted the most? Mm. Whoa, that's a good question. Okay, I think I have uh, I have the answer. So recently I've I'm really interested in integral psychology and uh, Cam Wilber has a really uh, good book. Uh, it's the title is the brief history, a brief history of everything, and like it's like I don't know, eighty percent is highlights <laughs> for me in that book. I haven't heard of this book, so now you've got me really intrigued. I'm gonna have to order this right when we get off here. Can you give me just even like a broad overview uh, of what are some of the things that the book dives into? Oh Jesus! So it's really complex. Uh, it's uh, it's not a it's not a light read. So prepare your body. It's basically <laughs> so th- this guy basically. He wasn't satisfied with the with the Western psychological materialistic approach, uh, and and he wasn't satisfied with the with the Eastern spiritual approach of uh, like deciphering life, so to say. So basically, what he did, uh, he studied like he's a genius, uh, and he studied everything. Like uh, he he dug deep into spirituality, all kinds of uh, spiritual schools: Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, Christianity. Um, Islam, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and also the Western schools of uh, psychology. So basically, what he did, uh, he tried to fuse these two um, different aspects and uh, and create uh, like like a unified theory. Uh, and uh, and that that's basically the book. This book is is the blueprint uh, of that uh, that philosophy. And um, yeah, uh, according to to his peers and his fans, this is. This is the um, like probably the, the masterpiece of uh, of his works. Like he he wrote a cup uh, he wrote a couple of books, uh, a couple dozen. So uh, he's a really really um, fruitful writer. But this this is the this is the best, I guess. You definitely have me intrigued. I love reading books that open my mind to new ways of thinking and different things I just haven't come across. So I'll certainly have to try that one out. You did mention a few minutes ago your love and fascination around meta-learning. For the people who are unfamiliar with that, can you just describe what meta-learning is? Meta-learning is basically learning how to learn. So basically the mental software of, uh, of learning, <laughs> like, like a skill set with which you can acquire new knowledge or new skills. I'm glad you kept that simple. I feel like too many times people try to make meta learning way more complicated than it needs to be. So what what even led you down this road and fascination into learning how to learn? Yeah, so that's a funny story. Um, there, there was a tipping point, and it's quite ironic that I, I realized this uh, at the end of my, my formal studies. So I, I, I studied tourism uh, for, for almost nine years. And the end, and the end, and the end of uh, college, I suddenly realized that I wasn't taught how to learn, which is, if you, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's totally crazy because you are spending uh, years, like a like a decade, uh, being a professional learner. Because if you're a student, you are basically a professional learner, and you you don't get the the, the proper software with which you can uh, multiply your effectiveness. So it's crazy, but people don't uh, like. We are not taught how to how to learn, and this realization made me made me super super angry. So uh, so I decided to dig uh, deep into uh, cognitive psychology. I read every book I find, and um, and I basically created my own theory. And it turns out that there are many many like there are a lot of uh, new research, a lot of insights that are readily readily available for us. Uh, for for mankind, but uh, it just it just simply don't uh, taught in in schools. So there is not no, no such a such subject as uh, um, like learning how to learn. <laughs> you just you just uh, you just get mathematics, uh, geography, etc., uh, etc. Et 
So that is that is not a dedicated subject uh, that teaches you the, the most important skill, I believe, uh, a man can process. So I'm so fascinated at the beginning of this journey, you, you mentioned some of the, the psychology you're diving into, the books you're reading. What have you discovered can kind of help that person begin that journey of learning how to learn? I think the biggest thing inside is, is what I mentioned already. There is a lot of great stuff already available. So you just have to go to the library, download a couple of uh, great books uh, on, on these techniques, like how to memorize uh, abstract things, like, for example, for in vocabulary, that's one thing. Uh, but these, these mental tools are, are not uh, taught. So um, yeah, so it's out there. You just, you just have to do some like, simple research and, and you can find them. Are there any other mediums other than books that you're consuming even today, not necessarily just when you became fascinated with meta learning? Are there blogs, different articles, uh, videos or courses you've gone to before? Yeah, I, th I think the main source of, uh, of my, my education is uh, just building a company. So it's, it's crazy demanding and I'm learning uh, complex stuff every single day, how to build a company, uh, how to treat people, how to manage people. Um, how to build a, a great product. So that's that's pretty much captures my my mental ca capacity. But other than that, I I listen to podcasts. So um, I'm riding to work by bicycle, and it's a it's a good 15 kilometers ride. So um, I can I can I can listen to a, a 45 minute podcast and uh, while while cycling. Um, so yeah, books books and podcasts these days. Yeah, well, the hands-on approach of building a business, I'm sure there's no better way to learn the ins and outs of that. So let's talk about your business. Your business is Drops. I would love for you just to give a high-level overview of what Drops is, what you guys are creating over there. Mm -hmm. Cool. So Drops is a, is a visual word puzzle, basically, that teaches languages. Uh, you're using visual association and proven tricks of memory champions. Uh, and we are focusing, that's, that's probably our main differentiator, that we are only focusing uh, on vocabulary, teaching uh, uh, core vocabulary. And um, yeah, so this is, a, this is a mobile app available for, for iOS and Android as well. And um, it's been named App of the Year by Google in 2018, so this December. And um, yeah, uh, the other big differentiator is, uh, is that it is a game from the ground up. So you probably heard about Duolingo and, um, and all these language courses, which, are, which seem to be a game, but they are really a gamified language course. And, uh, and the thing is that Drops is a game from the ground up. If you start playing, you immediately realize that this is, this is something different. And this, this was a really, really uh, conscious decision to, to really create a game. And, uh, and not just the gamified experience. Like we didn't want to just sprinkle uh, a thin layer of gamification on top of a classic language course. Yeah, speaking of gamification, this reminds me of a few other conversations I've had and the importance uh, of gamification. I know Daniel Gross over at Pioneer is huge in the gamification method. You mentioned this was very strategic on your behalf. Mm -hmm. So what is it about gamified learning that is just so important? Yeah, um, so yeah, so two things. Uh, as I mentioned, we are not just gamified. Drops is not just gamified. It's, it's also a game. But gamification, uh, it's, um, this is going to be a bit meta. Uh, but uh, it's, gamification is a great retention tool. So by gamifying a, boring, a potentially boring activity, uh, you can basically sugarcoat that activity, uh, which, which is uh, traditionally boring, like, for example, vocabulary learning. And it makes it, yeah, it, it makes it feels like a game. So there's a challenge, like a meta game that you're playing, collecting points, collecting badges, um, competing with your uh, mates. Um, so it's a great way. And to be honest, no matter how effective the method uh, that a certain app is using, uh, if people are not using it on a daily basis, it doesn't really matter, right? And we had to learn it the, the hard way <laughs> with our previous venture. But uh, and, and gamification is a great way to, to retain users. That's why that's why Duolingo has insane uh, retention, and uh, it just yeah these are these are basically tricks to to trigger primal uh, motivational levers. 
So this is something I've been thinking a lot. Uh, one of my businesses, obviously, is this podcast. If you were going to gamify and create game with a podcast, how would you go about that? Whoa, another great question. Uh, hmm. I need to think about this a bit. So, for example, collecting stuff is is really really effective. So, if you can, um, hmm, if you can somehow create certain achievements, to like obviously these are artificial creations. These achievements, if you can create these uh, achievable milestones for user. Uh, or, or like your list in, in 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 your case, listeners, uh, that might be a, a big thing. If you can uh, somehow reward streaks, like like the listener needs to listen to your podcast certain times, then there's going to be a reward uh, after after the a certain streak um, points. Yeah. So, so I mean, there is a there's a book. Uh, it's published by O'Reilly, and I don't. Yeah, gamification by design. That's the that's the name of the book. It's it was written by. Let me just uh, find the name of the guy. By Gabe Gabe Zickerman. I'm probably butchering his name. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but that that book contains the the matter of of gamification. It's, it's a really really good summary uh, or overview of of the best practices of gamification. There are there are a handful of of uh, best practices. So that book is is going to be a great uh, inspiration for you if you want to uh, understand the logic behind all these gamification tools. No, thank you. Yeah, it was an entirely selfish question. It's a it's an idea I've been trying to battle with for a while now. So I was interested just mm -hmm. to hear your overall thought mm -hmm. process. But I even want to know more about the origin story of Drops. You mentioned a previous venture that you guys failed with and had to learn from. So how did Drops come to be? Okay, cool. Um, so I'll start with my my fascination with languages. So I was born and raised in Hungary. It's a small Central European country with an isolated language. And uh, and I had to realize super early that uh, I can't get really far with knowing a Hungarian it's spoken in, in exactly one country. So I, I started to pick up languages, uh, first English, then, then Spanish, then I ventured into some German, uh, Danish. Uh, I just I just picked up a couple of Icelandic words uh, in January, and um, and so that that opens opens opened up a lot of opportunities for us uh, for me. And uh, and that meta learning obsession of mine came, and I, I realized that people uh, don't want to learn how to learn. So that was a hard realization. Uh, first, I wanted to to write a book about uh, learning how to learn, but I had to realize that uh, people want to learn specific things. So that's where the demand is. Uh, so I basically fused my two, two obsessions of mine: uh, meta learning and, and language learning, and I started to. Uh, to build products, um, lightweight product. I started with a paper-based flashcard. Then I, I created uh, an ebook for for acquiring vocabulary the, the most efficient way. It was a super simple electronic uh, product. And then I met my my uh, later co-founder Mark, and we started to build an app um, that teaches vocabulary. And um, I, I have to say, but but by the time that ebook started to generate uh, a decent amount of money, so if I would have continued that project, uh, I could live, live live off that uh, that business. But I jumped on a, on a new shiny object, which was uh, which was an app uh, app idea. Uh, back in the time, it was like everyone had a had an app app idea. So so did we. So we built um, um, a language learning app and. Uh, we got accepted into an Estonian startup accelerator, and basically we built the concept of learning visible uh, through through that uh, incubation period, which was uh, three months, and um, and it proved to be a, an epic failure. So it, it looked quite similar to to uh, to to drop. So it was also a visual language teaching app, but. Um, the big mistake what we what we made is that we we optimized for efficiency, learning efficiency. So, 
So we built this product for, for months uh, without really showing it to users. So that was obviously uh, another mistake we've made. Uh, so we didn't, we didn't get real life feedback. We got feedback from the, from the peers of the, of the accelerator batch, but obviously they were super biased. Like, uh, like we were, uh, yeah. So we were good friends. Uh, they, they were, were crazy honest and, and everyone said that, okay, this is beautiful. I'm going to use that. Uh, and we believe these users uh, and, and these people. But uh, when we launched Learning Visible, uh, it proved to be like the retention was super crappy. So they started to use it. They loved it, but they didn't return the next day. And uh, and I want to refer back to the to to that uh, that fact that no matter how effective your stuff is, uh, a learning a teaching method, if people are not using it on a daily basis, it doesn't matter. So basically, retention is effectiveness. And uh, it took a good two years to realize this. <laughs> so we tried to, to push Learning Visible through the dip and uh, we really believe that uh, this is a good product. Uh, people are, are going to come and, and the right people are going to find it and they are going to use it. And um, it didn't turn out to be the case. So, so we, we, we killed our baby. Uh, after two, two, a good two years of, of struggle, and then pivoted into drops. Um, and this, this was a really, really hard decision. I mean, uh, probably you had a couple of businesses and you knew that when you're building something, you're investing time uh, into something that you think is a good idea. It's really hard to admit that, uh, in fact, that might not be uh, what the world wants, even though you believe in it, because like, again, Sanko's fallacy, you invest a certain amount of time, certain amount of energy into the project. It's really, really hard to uh, let go and, and basically uh, start a new thing. So, so we decided to build, to take what worked. Uh, we, we knew that visual language learning and this vis visual aspect of learning is, is, is a no-brainer. It's, it's such a such a magical thing that works, and uh, and build the new product uh, focusing on retention. So retention was our god. That was what guided uh, the development, the the, the phase, the, the pivot into into drops. And we decided that um, we should build uh, a game because uh, because we had. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that that Estonian startup accelerator was a game-specific startup accelerator, and there are many, many great uh, gaming companies in uh, in the Nordic, and they they all came to Metros, like uh, people from Rovio who built Angry Birds, uh, people from Supercell. So all these seasoned game industry people uh, gave us their uh, best insights, and we knew that games are are a fascinating things because uh, they can be extremely addictive. So, so, so we did, there are proven recipes of games. Why not take those and inject those insights into, into learning? So we did just that and, um, and we built basically a game from the ground up and, and trying to preserve some, some really effective learning methods. So I hope we can dive a little bit deeper on getting real-time feedback, but feedback that's honest and understanding when to pivot or when to quit. So you mentioned mm -hmm. that you were getting feedback from people who were just too close to you guys. They couldn't be honest. So what do you do now to get better feedback that can truly tell you when things aren't working? Yeah, so uh, the good thing that we have a ton of users, uh, we have millions of active users worldwide, and they are paying customers and they are giving their honest feedback. I mean, you can imagine if someone is paying uh, <laughs> like $100 for a product, that person is going to give you the, the most honest feedback you can get. So we have a lot of uh, uh, reviews in the App Store, like um, 200,000 or something like that, uh, which is crazy. And we, have a, we, have, we also have a world-class uh, support team. They are, they are fabulous extracting these, these feedbacks from, uh, from real-world users. Uh, for testing new features, uh, we are using a, a, a service called UserBob. So basically, you can buy uh, uh, testers, like unbiased people who you are paying them, and and you can see their reaction. So uh, you are you are you are giving them a, a short uh, brief. What should they look for in the app? 
And basically, they are recording themselves, uh, like their facial expressions even. Like they, their facial expressions tell a lot. And also, you can see their hands. What are they doing? What are they tapping on? So that's that's one really good tool that is super, I'm, I'm biased, and we can we can test uh, new features and new ideas really really quickly. You've got to love where technology has taken us. That you have now have access to those millions of people who will become your testers and give you that great type of feedback. Anything else you do to to generate these feedback loops? Uh, good question. Other than that. Hmm. Yeah, we also do classical user, classic user testing, like uh, like just walking to a random person and and like inviting them for a coffee uh, in exchange for 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 an onboarding session. Uh, so we also do that. But yeah, we have we have plenty of information uh, to digest from 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 the reviews and uh, and from people who are who are writing us for tickets. You mentioned you went to that accelerator and the creators of Angry Birds are there and they're able to give you that proven recipe for success. How vital have those people who, I don't want to call them mentors, but people who have been there before, how important is surrounding yourself with those types of people? I think that's like having great mentors are essential. I I just want to correct you that they're not giving us the secret sauce of success. They are giving us proven uh, the bra- best practices of game design. Uh, that doesn't mean that using those bra- best practices uh, ensures that your product is going to be successful. So every single pro- uh, product is different, uh, but you can use these patterns that have like a high chance of, of success. Uh, yeah, so mentors were a huge part of our success, I guess. Like um, standing on the shoulders of, of giants uh, is like, it, it's really, really humbling experience when when someone i mean without any vested interest really like we we received a lot of advice from people who uh, who had no equity in our company they just they just gave gave us uh, advice and also like we are we are also trying to give back so uh, we are approached by by young entrepreneurs and and we are happy to um to give our two cents but yeah i mean these are these are absolutely like priceless advices I'd be curious to find out, you mentioned Patagonia earlier, and are there other Mm -hmm. businesses, companies, ideas outside of language learning and also game that you pull from and incorporate that into drops? Yeah, there are, there are many. So we are, we are really inspired by, by the work that Basecamp does. So they have, uh, they have a really uh, unique company building philosophy. uh, And that's something, uh, so they are, they are also they are walking according to their own drums. Uh, they are not following any playbook. They are creating their own playbook, and that's what we are doing. They are basically, obviously, they are they are a bit extreme <laughs> in terms of denying the this the Silicon Valley way of uh, building a business. Uh, but I think this this extreme point of view is really valuable because uh, it can inspire you uh, to do things that uh, that is not part of the like uh, like everyday conversation because like these days um, like the Silicon Valley way of building a startup is the um, the default uh, so to say and and it's not necessarily the best way for all the companies to to start and build a product so it, it's really good to to see the other side uh, like a, like a totally different opinion so Basecamp um, they are super super inspiring for us um, we are inspired by remote teams. Uh, who are building remote teams, for example, Buffer, uh, Automatic, uh, the mother company of, of WordPress, um, and yeah, some some gaming companies who are who are making big impact uh, with a few like a, like a handful of people. For example, Supercell is a great example. They are a Finnish company. Uh, they just sold themselves uh, or like the the a big uh, chunk of their company to Tencent, I believe, for for uh, like three or four billion dollars. And uh, so they, they, they created a Clash of Clans, uh, Heyday, um, Clash Royale. So these big, big gaming hits with just a handful of uh, handful of people. So that's why, by the way, they are called super cells, uh, super cell because they are working in small cells, like small teams of seasoned uh, game designers and, and um, artists and, and marketers. 
So they, we are really, really inspired by them that that small team can achieve like huge things. Something I appreciate about what you guys do is you don't just go by traditional norms. And and you mentioned what they're doing at Basecamp. And for listeners more interested in that, you can go to episode 100 with David Heinemeiner Hansen, and we dive deep onto some of their philosophies and processes. But I, I'm also wondering what type of ideas and big idea thinking do you guys do? I, I guess I'm more interested in when you're planning next steps for the business and you're thinking of some of these ideas, what is that process like inside of Drops? So we have a, we have a good idea where we are, what's the end goal for us? So the end goal for us is to, to be the ultimate vocabulary teaching app. And um, I, th- I think that what we are doing differently probably than, than most companies or most competitors is that we don't care, care about competitors. So we are not looking at uh, any of the language learning apps, what, what they are doing, what new features did they come up with. Uh, we, we just have our own ideas, uh, our own insights, and, um, and we are trying to follow that vision. And um, yeah, I, I mean, we are, just, we are just working with really, really smart people and we let them do the work and we let them uh, be smart and let them share their ideas. And these, are the, uh, these ideas, uh, if they are given space, um, they, are, they are creating great stuff. So no. Can you talk further about giving those ideas space? So we are a flat company. Uh, this company has three executives, me, uh, Mark, the CTO, and, and we have a, a marketing executive, uh, Drew. But we are basically a flat company. So, so every single team member is a domain owner. And, uh, and uh, the decision-making process is, is really, really demo- democratic. So if uh, a- anyone can come up with an idea, and it's not like a top-down decision making that I'm the, the leader of this company is deciding. Of course, we are we are showing the vision, we are having the vision, we are uh, we are showing the direction, the general direction where we are heading towards. But we are listening to every single team member because really we believe that we we hired right, we hired uh, really smart people, and we we are listening to them. And um, and. If the team thinks that, for example, another team member's idea is better than mine, for example, I'm, I'm totally off for going that way. You mentioned hiring smart and having that team of just very intelligent people. Anything you guys do specifically around hiring? Are there questions you ask, interview processes you use? Yeah, I think our, int- uh, our hiring process, hiring funnel is quite rigorous. Um, it's like, I don't know, six to eight stages we are um yeah and um so the advantage of being a remote team has this uh this advantage that we can uh, the the talent pool is is basically the whole world so so we can we can hire uh people from from i don't know um from wherever we want so um so we have uh, we have a, a great pool of talents. That that's one uh, major advantage of, of being a remote team. Um, so sourcing is not that difficult, and also we can uh, we can optimize for uh, like ghetto arbitrage. Like obviously, in certain countries, salaries are not that high as in as in Silicon Valley as well. Uh, even though the the skill set of that certain person is at least as high quality as a as a Silicon Valley e- equivalent. So the process, um, I mean, first of all, uh, we are, we are creating a really, really detailed, um, job description and, uh, and we have a very, very clear goal. What kind of person, uh, do we need? Of course, um, that person needs to fit a certain skill set, uh, but it's really important to be a great team fit because, uh, and, and that's why we are not really hiring. I, I mentioned that we are hiring, uh, world class people, but we are not hiring, uh, these uh, rock stars. Uh, we are not. We are not because because rock stars like who are like top one percent uh, or or even smaller percentage. They tend to be ego egoistic and uh, they tend to not to fit into the team really well and not to collaborate really well. 
So I think I think our biggest strength is uh, team cohesion. So so team fit is is absolutely a, a crucial factor when you're hiring. So so basically we are creating a job description. We are posting it in uh, various um, uh, remote sites. We we are usually using remote uh, job boards like uh, Remote OK IO or uh, we work remotely and. Uh, and sometimes you are reaching out to certain people. So if we have certain people in our minds, we are reaching out directly, uh, proactively to that person. Uh, if, if that person is thinking about, uh, changing jobs. Um, and then like there is an incoming stream of candidates. We are doing, um, uh, an email screening with a couple of rapid fire questions. Uh, we are checking, um, like how big, uh, remote if, uh, working experience the person has, uh, like a ballpark salary expectation, um, like these kind of things, uh, that, that fit our culture. Like, uh, we are having a quarterly meetings in a certain geographical location. And, uh, and it's really important that that person should be available to, or have, have the willingness to, to travel to, uh, to that location every quarter. Uh, and so, so we do a quick probing, uh, along these questions. And if everything is all right, we are, we are doing a quick, uh, quick interview. It's a, like, um, a 10 minute interview, uh, roughly to, to basically check the, the basic chemistry amongst us. And, uh, and if, everything is, uh, super glittery. Then we are, we are asking the candidate to do a trial day for us. I think this is, this is absolutely crucial to, to actually do some, some, some work together and, and, um, experiencing how, how the work is, how the work feels with that person, how he or she communicates with others. Uh, and what is the product of course that, uh, that that person delivers in a very, very tight, uh, time frame. that is one day. And uh, if everything is all right with that, then we are having a, a long interview. Um, usually, uh, Drew and Mark joins me for that long interview, and we are talking about everything, like uh, the life story of the person. And and again, we are trying to find those uh, those points that that prove that that person is really really a good team fit, or will be a a, a good team fit. If everything is all right, then. Uh, you'll probably send a, send a, an offer. <laughs> I'm interested about that team fit. And you mentioned the very long interview there, which is almost the final component of it. Are there any questions that you found very helpful in understanding if this person will be a good team fit? Yeah, so we have a couple of uh, company principles. Uh, for example, extreme honesty is, uh, I think that's one of the big things that uh, make us uh, who we are. So really being able to um, tell each other what is the truth is uh, is so underrated and, and so rare, by the way. So it's really hard. Uh, I mean, this is against the human nature. You don't want to offend um, someone. But uh, if, I mean, like, you need to be honest. Uh, and as soon as, because, I mean, clear communication, again, accelerates this feedback loop. If you have problem with someone uh, or something, uh, if you say it quickly, uh, there could be a quick solution. If you if you keep to yourself and you are just you are just trying to solve it in your mind, then uh, it might it might poison relationships. It might only poison the workflow. Um, and that's again, I think that's a really really rare uh, attribute of people. So if you find someone uh, who can be um, extremely honest, and that that's what we are um, expecting from 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 all, all, all our team members, or at least have the willingness, uh, have the have the seed of of this uh, extreme honesty, because uh, because usually that's not the default for people. So people who are coming from big companies or like honesty is uh, is not necessarily advantageous <laughs> in those contexts. But we are we are totally appreciating. And again, it, it, it has something to do with how we are uh, treating uh, mistakes, how we are handling mistakes. So again, that, that tracks back to my, my learning obsession. For me, mistakes are like integ an integral part of, of, of the learning process. So that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's a bad thing in case it's not processed, if the lessons are not drawn. Um, 
but it's 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 a wonderful end. This is an experiment, right? Like a failed experiment uh, from which you can you can extract uh, data and you can build into your playbook and 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 improve. But you need honesty to to admit uh, these mistakes, and this is super hard. You mentioned able to build this and put this into your playbook. Do you actually have a company playbook or your own personal playbook of things you've acquired throughout the years that work well? Yeah, so we have a very informal document we can call like a like a company culture document. Uh, and we are constantly iterating on that. It, it's available for, for all the team members. Uh, me personally, I do have, so I'm, I'm collecting uh, great mental models and uh, and I'm trying to extract like no matter what happens to me in life, uh, I'm actually doing some super basic journaling. Like at the end of the day, I'm I'm jotting down what went right, what went wrong, and and trying to find the the meta pattern behind that uh, that experience, and uh, and trying to find uh, like trying to compare that pattern uh, with others. Um, and these patterns arise, and it, it's such a good thing, such a such a great experience to 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 figure out that that pattern already ar- arose. Because if you are not reflecting on that, uh, these mistakes are going to repeat themselves. But if you if you realize that, okay, if you realize the cause and you can name the cause, that's uh, that's a whole different story. And you, you you'll you'll have uh, you'll have the, the the weapon with which you can uh, tackle next time. I love that. I want to dive into this. So you mentioned mental models and developing your own mental models. This is something I've been fascinated with for a while. I've been trying to build out my own playbook of mental models I use most frequently. What are some of the ones you go to often? Uh, You mean mental models? Correct. So these days I'm fascinated by by mental model. I'm I'm pretty sure I, I, uh, I build this up in my own mind. Okay, this is not crazy new, but uh, I'm I'm basically living my life uh, on the lines of resources. So I have this mental model set in my mind that life is about managing resources, uh, managing time. In my in my, in my mental model, uh, it, these uh, resources consist of time, uh, energies, money, uh, social connections. Mobility, so that's a tricky one. The last one, uh, and and basically the balance of these mental models, and and the the, the fifth one is knowledge, uh, and the balance of these mental models uh, will give a good picture about your life, like how your your life is balanced. And if if uh, if the level of uh, of these resources go below a certain level, like something is going to uh, feel bad, no matter how. The, the rest of the resources perform, right? Like uh, no matter if you have the money, you have the social connections, you have the knowledge, if your health, your energies uh, are, are lower than, than it should be, then you're, you, will feel, uh, you, will feel, you will feel bad. Uh, no matter if you're super healthy, you have the knowledge, you have the right people in your life, if if you have no money, you're you're going to struggle, and and so on and so forth. So so I, I really reflect on these resources, like how my resources levels are uh, at any given time, and if some something is off balance, then I'll try to focus on that and and just bring it to the to the right level. How long have you been developing this framework? Well, so it's it's an ongoing process. So I'm I'm uh, gradually developing it, and and um, yeah, it, it's it's a work in progress. But uh, I think I started this four years ago, roughly, and uh, yeah, by 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 this time, it it, it became quite a complex uh, mental model. I'm always interested about the self work people do, and you mentioned sitting there, really being able to assess these different things. How do you give yourself the time to do that? Is it just when new ideas pop in your head, you sit down and, and start journaling? Or do you actually schedule time to fit this into your day? Yeah. So I think space is, uh, is, a, is also a resource. Like the, the time aspect of, of my resource mental model, uh, a huge, huge thing is, is like creating uh, space for, for these thoughts consciously. Like scheduling, actually scheduling uh, time where you are like thinking time, 
like when you are just walking and and thinking when you are swimming and and walking i, I have a couple of uh of, of these tools i'm using like uh i'm using walking swimming mountain biking uh just sitting in a coffee um and um and yeah just just really consciously schedule time for it because uh because things are going to fill up your time and your timetable. And if you, if you don't schedule time for, for these spaces, and it's really, really hard to justify, uh, these, these empty times. It's, it's really against, uh, like, uh, this notion of productivity. But in fact, think about it, like creating space and, and ensuring that you have, uh, uh, you have space for your ideas to expand into. That's, um, that's totally crucial for, for, uh, for a creative individual. Uh, but yeah, as, and I think the same applies to meditation. It's really hard to justify even even just ten minutes um, of sitting and doing nothing. So if you are a high achiever, this is crazy painful at the beginning. But as you start to feel the effect, uh, the the benefits of these uh, activities, or 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 in terms of uh, meditation, like activity less activities, then uh, you are. Yeah, you are convincing your critical mind that these are actually valuable and these needs to be scheduled into your uh, timetable. Yeah, this is one of those realizations I've had over the last few years where I contributed the amount I was actively doing with productivity and I found the more space I've given myself, my productivity actually goes up. Mm -hmm. Totally. So when you're journaling, I, I, I guess I'm thinking about your idea generation process. And so you, you mentioned some of these frameworks you're working off of. Are you just writing these out or are you a very visual person where you're drawing diagrams for how all these work in your life? Yeah, so I love drawing and I use multiple tools for, for creating ideas and processing ideas. So I use, I use my laptop mind mapping software uh just a, or just a text editor i use i use ipad so ipad for me like ipad puts me into a totally different context and i also, also use paper notebooks and it brings me into a totally new uh, mindset so i choose the weapon of my creation according to yeah what i want to achieve uh and i also and i also have this um interesting so note taking i i use siri as a as a secretary basically um, sometimes I just hop on my, my mountain bike, uh, go to the, go to the woods and I have my AirPods in my, in my ear, my, my, um, iPad in my, in my backpack and, and I can, uh, dictate, uh, like if there, there is a, there's a comment to, to Siri, you say, uh, note, you wait a, a second and then say what you are, you, you want to, uh, be noted and it's going to wait for you in the, amongst the notes. So it basically uh, voice recognition, and you're basically riding your bicycle. If an idea pops in, you just say note, and and, um, and say what you uh, what you want to capture. And um, when you finish your bike ride, your your notes are going to wait you uh, in the notes. So that's 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 I, I love that uh, method of of taking notes, like just doing some light cardio. It can be it can be walking, and and you don't want you you don't have to. Uh, uh, basically stop what you are doing, you are just saying it. Uh, and it's it's incredibly powerful. I'm so glad you brought that up because that was a tip I didn't know and it always frustrated me. I thought I had to reopen my phone every time. So if I just say into the phone, note Siri will automatically bring that up? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> now you, you have me so excited about this, Danny. I'm pumped about that one. Well, I guess I want to circle back to what you were talking about and using each one of these as a different weapon, whether it be the iPad, the physical notebook, what works well for you in different contexts? So when are you going to the iPad? When are you going to the notebook? Are there certain things you like to capture there? Yes. So, so I, use, I usually use paper-based uh, notebooks for, for sketching ideas, like making diagrams. Uh, I usually use iPad for, for drafting. A drafting, uh, I don't know, a presentation or uh, drafting uh, uh, a product proposal, and I, yeah, I pretty much use laptop for for everything else. So, uh, like editing text and so forth and so on. Fantastic. I want to circle back to drops now, and you were talking about building a team and, and what goes into that. And I'm interested why you guys elected not to raise money. Whoa. Uh, 
it kind of it kind of happened uh, organically. So back when back in the time when we got accepted to this uh, Estonian uh, accelerator, we received a, a tiny sum of uh, seed money, uh, but we we basically burned it uh, throughout that three months of uh, incubation, uh, and and so the drops project uh, didn't get any any seed money, any investment. So it's pretty much purely uh, pure uh, bootstrapped. Uh, project we decided to not uh making compromises because if you are raising money uh that's not free so that money is going to uh, knock, on, knock on your door after a couple of years uh, and of course the process of fundraising i mean the the thing is that we just we just simply decided to build a product instead of uh of um, spending our time on talking with VCs, uh, investors, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of happened organically. Um, it might um, made the reaching the tipping point a bit slower, but we are super, super glad that we, we chose this way. Um, and yeah, I mean, we reached a certain tipping point where it, uh, Basically, drops was cash flow, uh, cash flow, and cash flow positive and, and profitable from from day one. And uh, and when we reached the, the the tipping point where we could go uh, full time, uh, both me and Mark, then uh, the growth was so fast and um, so seamless. Uh, we just we just didn't need to to raise money. I mean, these days I have we have. We have multiple years of operational buffer in the bank. So if, if everything goes south and the revenue stream stops, then we could still uh, survive and figure out a solution uh, for for two years. So we are in a really comfortable situation. Um, and yeah, don't get me wrong, I'm not against uh, fundraising. So um, I'm pretty sure that there are some, some company uh, structures and uh, certain pro uh, pro uh, products, for example, hardware, which um, might require uh, raising funds, and I can totally imagine a scenario where we where we will want to raise some money. Um, yeah, it just it's just good to to not being pressured by by anyone. Uh, so we can build this, the company that we wanted. We can uh, we can hire at the pace that is ideal for us. We don't want to die in the process. We want to enjoy the, the reason why we've worked so hard uh, for for all these years is to is to be able to uh, build the company that we, we love working for. Yeah, two excellent points you bring up there, building the company you want to. And then I think a lot of founders forget about the time constraints that fundraising is going to put on their ability to actually grow the fundamentals of their business. So it's really cool hearing you talk about that. What are the long term plans for you guys over at Drops? What are you hoping to get to? Whoa. Uh, yeah, so the mission is to build the ultimate vocabulary teaching app. So we're absolutely focusing on, on product and users. Uh, we, we just want to build the best product possible. Um, and our so, so we don't really have a, an exit plan, <laughs> an exit strategy. And it, it might sound shocking, but uh, I think exit and a potential acquisition or, or these offers are going to come. And um, and we'll just need, need to decide at a certain point uh, whether or not we want to accept it or, or not, or continue the journey and, uh, and and keep doing the the product. I mean, we are really really curious guys. So obviously, I have uh, other ideas I could work on, but I'm just so I'm just, I'm just enjoying this process and and really being able to build a company. Uh, designing the company uh, to your own taste, and um, and yeah, just we, we are just fascinated that that uh, what we're building is actually needed, and, and people love or what we're working. It's it's a sensational feeling. Yeah, it's certainly something that's needed. You guys are certainly filling that void there. You mentioned some of the ideas you have floating around. You want to give us an idea of some of the things that you have floating around your mind? Uh, yeah, so it has something to do with learning, <laughs> as you might guess. Um, but that's yeah. So so language learning is is a is a niche. It's a superpower, I think. So this this skill is uh, like it's a super high leverage, high impact skill. Um, but uh, but again, again, my my main obsession is math learning. So so that new idea might uh, do something to do with that. 
uh, it's a it's a more more grandiose idea, but it's really really uh, so it's, it's really early times. Uh, so um, I, I'm pretty sure I'm I'm going to be uh, I'm going to be um, captured by by drops for for the next three years. So I'm uh, I'm 100 percent dedicated to drops right now, and uh, and until until we are reaching that goal of, of uh, becoming the ultimate vocabulary teaching tool i think i'm pretty much covered so yeah. so by the way one of the big lessons of uh, of my previous entrepreneurial entrepreneurial journey and, and failures is that um, like there are so many so many options so many shiny objects you can jump on um, it just it's it's so valuable to to stick to something uh, that works and uh, and build it consistently for years, for months, um, and and not jumping to the next big thing. Uh, I think this is this is something I, I had to learn uh, as as I grew older that this is absolutely essential for 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 uh, for long lasting success. I can never hear that enough. It's something I always have to remind myself of to focus and stick to those few key things. You mentioned meta-learning a lot throughout this conversation. Besides yourself, who do you think might be the most wickedly talented meta-learner? Hmm. I would say Elon Musk. Yeah. I, I think entrepreneurship, good entrepreneurs by definition must be great meta-learners. Like you have to pick up so many skills uh, at, a, at a very decent level. Uh, it's absolutely crucial and it's Pretty much a precursor of uh, of, of being a, a good good ant- entrepreneur. So so everyone who is a, um, a CEO or a founder of a, of a great company by definition by definition they they must be a metal learner, uh, a great metal learner. Yeah, Elon Musk is someone I love studying, hearing about his processes, how he breaks things down. So it was exciting to hear you bring that up. So let's know more about Drops. Where can the listeners stay connected with the Drops? Where can they check out the app? Let us know. Yeah, so we have a website, uh, languagedrops.com. They can uh, they can get um, all the details, the links to, to our iTunes page and uh, App Store page. And you can find us on, on the App Store. Uh, and in uh, in the Google Play Store, you just type in drops, and the first result will be will be language drops. Fantastic. Well, Danny, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. It's been a treat. Thank you so much for having me. You guys made it to the end of another episode of What Got You There. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I really do appreciate you taking the time to listen all the way through. If you found value in this, the best way you can support the show is giving us a review, rating it, sharing it with your friends, and also sharing on social. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Looking forward to you guys listening to another episode. Each week, so many amazing podcasts come out. Unfortunately, we just don't have the time to listen to them all. That's why I love podcast notes. What Podcast Notes does is they write up some of the top podcasts and top episodes with their tips, takeaways, and quotes so you get everything you need out of that episode without having to spend all that time listening. They also have an unbelievable weekly newsletter. And this weekly newsletter has the takeaways from the top business, health, and lifestyle podcasts. It's one of the few newsletters I subscribe to and certainly think you guys would love checking it out. So remember, it's podcastnotes.org and also subscribe to that weekly newsletter they're putting out. Making change transpire. That's the mission behind the most amazing tasting protein bar brand taking the nutrition industry by storm. That brand, they're MCT Co. And they make the most delicious, keto-friendly, all-natural collagen protein bars. If you're obsessed with the quality of food going into your body like I am, then head out and pick up these amazing bars jammed with 10 grams of collagen protein. They only have two to three net carbs, no added sugar, and loaded with high quality MCT oil for the healthy fats from coconuts. Whether you're busy running the kids around from activity to activity, a professional athlete, or just someone looking for a great tasting convenience snack, do yourself a favor, head to mctco.com and use code WGYT for 20% off your order. Do you guys miss your favorite childhood cereals but had to give them up because of all the sugar? Meet 
Catalina Crunch, the world's first keto-friendly, zero-sugar cereal in delicious dark chocolate, cinnamon toast, maple waffle, and honey graham. When the founder of Catalina Crunch was diagnosed at age 17 with type 1 diabetes, he set out to satisfy his chocolate craving and created his own. This low-carb, zero-sugar cereal will power you through the day with 10 grams of plant-based protein, 6 grams grams of fiber to fill you up and is also gluten-free, grain-free, dairy-free, and 100% plant-based. Don't forget about that turmeric as well to help fight inflammation and boost immunity. If you want to enjoy and receive 10% off your entire order, head to CatalinaCrunch.com. That's Catalina, C-A-T-A-L-I-N-A, Crunch.com, and use code WGYT10 for 10% off. I just finished snacking on some of the dark chocolate, and it was delicious. You guys need to head out and pick some up today. If you guys enjoyed the smooth sounds of today's episode, then you can thank Brian Lapries, our sound engineer. And if you enjoy the intro song, check out Justin Great, the man behind it. I can't thank you guys enough for listening. Looking forward to you tuning in next time. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you?